What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Tipped in Tone. I am Rhett. I'm Zach. We're back. We're here. We're out here. I got We're new lights. <laughs> yeah, and a new angle. A new angle because uh, filming in a cube is uh, really hard. No, you're doing it though. You got the leading lines going on. Listen, we've been we've been working behind the scenes over at Mythos HQ on getting Zach's video set up together because uh, they're going to be doing more video stuff over there. Can we can we say that? Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. We're we're going to try. I uh, the poor Amazon delivery guy. <laughs> Every day he's just got a ton of boxes. He's like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> uh huh. And yeah, like, I'm proud of you. Business. It's like every everything that you've asked and, and I've given you advice on gear wise for, for video and film, you've just gotten. It's well, like, okay, cool. D- wasn't it you that said buy once, cry once? Buy once, cry once. Yep. <laughs> so yep. yeah, we got we got the uh the UA uh a four seven ten D for the mic uh preamps. I got the the Amaran and aperture lights and uh still gotta figure out some of these other things because I still got some shadow which is bothering me, but Your background needs a little bit of work, but that's all right. Yeah, we'll, 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 get, we'll get there. It's, it's, it's a, it's a long road, but how are you doing, man? I'm good, man. We, uh, so my, my friend roof man, also known as Tice, uh, and Tice. his wonderful girlfriend, Sarah are over from the Netherlands right now. Um, I've been working with him for a few years now. I played on his record in 2021. Then we went over to Europe and played on his tour. And so now he's here hanging out and I'm producing his EP here in the studio, even though it's a half finished studio, we're still using it. And uh, we've been doing that this week, recording to the 388. We're doing it all on tape, which is fun. Um, You know, had a good 4th of July, tried to give the Europeans a, the most American 4th of July experience possible. And I think we succeeded. Oh man. Did you rent like four wheelers and like, <laughs> get like the, m16s and like shoot them off the bat no no so okay maybe not the most american but we did over the weekend we did a braves game then we Uh, went to the lake for two days then we shot off a shitload of fireworks off the dock on the lake then uh we had a bunch of barbecue and then i smoked some wings and then we shot off some more fireworks drank a bunch of beer and america Man, uh, I'll, all I try to do during 4th of July is cover my cars so the neighbors don't get all the fireworks crap all over mm-hmm. our stuff. Because I living in a small uh, neighborhood really stinks. But, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. That's, that sort of thing just drives me nuts. I didn't – I always enjoyed – the fourth when i grew up like in a small rural town and like no one like you didn't really bother anybody and no one really bothered you when you shot fireworks and were acting crazy but when you're like you know shoulder to shoulder with a bunch of people it just becomes like what are what are these people doing yeah like, the older i've gotten I've, I've actually become more like anti-fireworks in the neighborhood yeah. and stuff but we did it this year just because they've it, they wanted to do it and we, we were right. out on a dock in a cove on a lake and that was over the weekend, but the for the actual fourth, my neighbor across the street was like lighting off these giant mortars, mm-hmm. and that wasn't cool. It was like going off for an hour. My dog was freaking out. Phil's dog was freaking out, and we were like having to manage the dogs, and it was a whole thing. So yeah, yeah, firework I've, responsibly. Yeah, there there have definitely been some neighbors in our uh, like you know me, and anyone that listens to this can probably tell I'm not very confrontational. But I'm argumentative, but I'm yeah. not confrontational. There's a difference. And, yeah, and I th- there was there were some neighbors that had had I don't know. It looked like you could drop a basketball in it, like a tube that <laughs> launched the fireworks, and it just sounded like a cannon was like going artillery. off in the neighbor. Yeah, just mortar strike. <laughs> and um, I I got up in the middle of the night, put my clothes on, and like drove down there and like banged on the door and told him to stop, which is like a that's a big thing for me. Yeah. But um, in in other news, we're just uh, uh, reeling from the fact that McKinley, that works for worked for us, is now going full time at Carter. He hey. we're down a down a builder, but it's okay. But McKinley, we will be missed at the shop. Man, I didn't know that was happening. Yeah, he's our he's our shred master uh general <laughs> we'll be missed at the shop but there's always call of duty that's right um before we get started let's uh let's thank all the fine folks over on patreon so the dipped in tone patreon we have a couple tiers you can support the show uh get behind the scenes access on our discord uh submit rigs for dipping and 
all sorts of other really great benefits. So if you want to join up uh, on our Patreon and support the show, uh, check the link in the description below and uh, just yep. come, come have fun with us. Yeah, it's get, if you want to submit your rig to be dipped by us and a celebrity guest, you have to be a patron. And also, the Discord's pretty pretty happening. People over yeah. there are like, you know, it's a cool little community that's forming. And uh, you can listen to episodes live while we tape them, get access to uh, special Patreon Q&As as we put them up. And uh, it's just a, a good time. If you want to support the show, Patreon, link down below. Uh, also, that there's merch coming. We're working on that behind the scenes. We've had a yes. few comments and, and questions about that. So, yes, we are going to be bringing back a line of merch. It's coming. We just want to, we, we're trying to figure it out to make it so that we can actually get really high quality good stuff you yeah. know that people want to wear so yeah and and if you have any ideas or suggestions please <laughs> send them our way because mm -hmm. um being creative and coming up with new design ideas for all that sort of stuff is very hard so any <laughs> any input is welcome um but before we get on to our our fabulous guest we also have to thank the sponsor of the show that's stumac you can go to stumac.com slash dipped in tone get 10 percent off your order for anything you need to work on uh really anything uh, equipment related guitars amps pedals all this stuff i've seen uh, josh scott has been doing some build series uh with their their kits and that's really cool so if you want to get into like pedal building and uh, not dive into the deep end of all the parts suppliers and all that really complicated stuff, the do it yourself aspect in that way, a Stumac kit would be a great way to kind of get your feet wet in the pedal building world. And the kit thing is cool. I've done it a few times myself and it's actually, it can be a somewhat economical way to get into a new pedal. If yes. you've already got even just a basic soldering iron and a little space to work, you can get these pedal kits you know, of a, of a fuzz face or whatever it is that you might be looking at and build it yourself. And then you can get creative and paint the thing yourself or, or, you know, change the led color, do whatever you want. Uh, they're a lot of fun. So stumac.com. Yeah. Thank you to stumac for sponsoring today's episode. 10% off link is in the description box down below. And, uh, yeah. Who do we have for today's guest? So, for today's guest, we have that that one guitarist that you've probably seen on Instagram, uh, oh, yeah. Mr. Nathaniel Murphy. Of AKA CME Zeppelin Barnatra. Yes. Genuinely one of, in my opinion, one of the best players out there today. He's so versatile. He's unbelievably skilled. Uh, if, you, if you don't follow him, do yourself a favor and go check him out on Instagram and TikTok too. I think he's on TikTok, so. I think he's on all the things. We're going to get him on threads soon. But yeah, he... threads. Threads coming up next. <laughs> but yeah, he's one of those players that you go, how how is he playing both those guitar parts at the same time? Uh, and it's 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 kind of mind bending to watch him do these the rhythm part and the melody part. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't really when you first look at it, you're like, how it doesn't compute it, like for the most part and anytime i've shown him to somebody they're like wait 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 is someone else behind him like playing another yep. part yep he's just a remarkable player and and what a nice guy without further ado here is our chat with nathaniel murphy nathaniel what's up man what's happening how's it going thanks for joining us dude no thank you for having me on honored to honest to be on it honored to have you how are uh how are things things are going very well just uh busy up here in chicago you know demos and whatnot and the usual which is good summer season so it's, it's uh, a lot of uh, big artists are coming through the store as well which is good you know yeah has has Lollapalooza has that was earlier this season right or is it later this summer it's, it's coming up it's like the first weekend of August so you guys are probably gonna be pretty busy then yes and no see the thing with that is that it's kind of hard for artists who are playing there to come back, come to the shop and get back in. You know, it's a, it's a bit of a nightmare because it's such a huge event. So, some undoubtedly will, and we'll obviously we'll be reaching out to people to come in and check it out. But like some, maybe some of the bigger artists, it's like, you know, they've got to leave Lollapalooza downtown. They've got to get to the shop, check it out and get back in. You know, it's not impossible, but it's, it's a little bit trickier with Lollapalooza, you know. When those events happening or are happening, is the shop just an absolute madhouse? It, it can be. So Monday last week, Noel Gallagher was in the shop. 
on the Wednesday, Carlos Santana was in the shop. So it's just that, that, that was only Monday to Wednesday. Uh, how mad is that? You know. So and the shop in question we should point out is Chicago Music Exchange CME. Exchange. Right? For those those of you who might not be aware, Nathaniel uh, has been with them what two or three years now. Well, two be just over two years as a full time employee. But I was doing videos previously before that. Because uh, I was I was obviously a soccer coach over here, so I was uh, coaching soccer and then on the side, you know, doing demos for CME, which you know is an interesting mix. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if you've not been to CME, it's it's genuinely one of the most impressive guitar shops in the world. It's beautiful. It's huge. The selection of stuff they have in there is, uh, I mean, just the number of Les Pauls that they have on the mm. wall. Yeah. I mean, my do they still have the uh, the Dove the B Bender? They said, well, it's not for sale, thankfully. Uh, thankfully. I mean, I think your video helped with that as well, I've got to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's crazy because people will come in asking to see that guitar. It's like, yep, yeah, here you go. It's, it's That's very awesome, cool. man. That's yeah. awesome. CME is one of those places that it is like the benchmark for what a guitar store should be. And, and I'm not, you know, Mythos pedals are carried there. I'm not trying to like... <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, uh, blow smoke or anything but it, it truly is like ha- living in nashville i get to go to a lot of great shops and i've been to a ton of great guitar guitar stores all over the the country but when you walk in there it's it's so it's just nice it, and, and they have everything unlike some shops and i'm not naming names but you walk in and um just kind of a mess it, you know yeah. sometimes you get kind of a pawn shop vibe not that that's a bad thing but CME is truly a destination, and yeah, if you've never been, like I think it's you have to go. If it's, you have yeah, I mean, you, you walk in, it's like an audible gasp, you know, yeah. when you when you walk in there, it's like fucking up. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I don't know. Should I not be a? Uh, well, no, you can you can say whatever you want in the show. It's just it's just a natural. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll, I should say that instead. But yes, yeah, it's, it's a very cool place to work. So I'm I'm honored to uh, to do that. So you've got a really interesting story. We we talked about it on a couple of years ago on my old podcast. But for for people who are unaware, what, give us a, a bit of a backstory because you, like you just mentioned, you haven't been a full time guitar player for very long, and you've b- managed to become one of the greatest guitar players out there today, in my opinion. You know, for those of you who don't follow Nathaniel on Instagram, Zeppelin Barnatra. You have definitely seen him somewhere. I mean, the videos you've posted over the years have accrued millions and millions of views. Um, and it comes down to your playing style. Like you have such a unique and well-versed style, but you did all that, I guess, as a just a hobby for a while while you were coaching soccer, right? Yeah, I mean, very, very kind words from you there, Rhett. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean... Back in Manchester, um, there wasn't much going on for me. I was, I was teaching a bit of guitar. I was doing a bit of uh, coaching soccer as well. And then a mate of mine moved over here. And he said, look, I can get you a job coaching soccer over here if you want. And I was like, yeah, I'd, I'd rather do that. And plus, I imagine there'd be more opportunities for me in America guitar-wise. I mean, guitar has always been the number one goal to become a professional guitar player of some sort. Um, but, yeah, I was coaching here for nine and a half years Um and, you know, thankfully, you know, I, I, I was in CME uh, one day and uh, I got chatting with one of the guys there and was like, look, do you want to do some videos for us? I was like, yeah, absolutely. You know, and so that kind of happened. And then a couple of years later, the shop was like, look, we want you to do full time demos with us. You know, just none of this here and, you know, a little bit here and there. It's like, just come on full time. And it thankfully happened, you know. Uh, so I've, I mean, I'm, I'm very proud of that. It's, it's a dream for me. I'm technically a guitar player. Uh, I get paid to be a guitar player, so that for me is, is a huge thing, you know. So uh, not not in the way I imagined it, you know, but it's you know, still an incredibly cool thing. We'll, we'll have to title this episode Nathaniel Murphy, technically a guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> just, just. <laughs> a little bit of coaching on the weekends, private. <laughs> That's amazing, man. <laughs> Can you tell us uh, a little bit of the the reasoning behind your instagram name because anytime i go to search i always type your name and i forget oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well it's it's again i apologize in advance because it's a ridiculous name it causes a lot of pronunciation problems as well and so essentially it started out um 
remember when Zeppelin got together for that one-off concert in, I think it was like 2007, 2006, mm-hmm. whatever. Um, so I'm only probably about 14 or something at the time. And the only way you could get tickets for that was by emailing or something. You had to have an email address. I'm 14 years old or whatever in Manchester. No 14-year-old has an email address back then, you know. So I thought, you know, I'll try and be smart here. I'm not going to put Nathaniel Murphy at AOL.com. I'm going to put Zeppelin so they know I really like them. And then for some reason, God knows why, I put the name of the village in Ireland that my family is from. So hence you get Zeppelin Born a Troll at AOL.com. Now, that email is dead. So if you try email, it's not gone anywhere. But, um, yeah, why I chose that, why I didn't just do Nathaniel Murphy, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then... Uh, Fast forward to living over here, I used to busk out in the streets here, uh, down on Michigan Avenue. I used to do street performance, and I wasn't on Instagram at the time, but I had a card that said, you know, Nathaniel Murphy, guitarist, you know, hire me, whatever, and it just had my name, uh, sorry, my number and my email address on it, and I started getting emails off people saying, oh, I love your videos on Instagram. And I was like, well, I'm not on Instagram, but, you know, I'll check it out. Um, and lo and behold, there was a couple of videos on me there playing out in the street, so I joined it. Um, started posting a few videos, but yeah, I don't know why I decided to choose Zeppelin Bornetro as my Instagram handle as well, but it's too late to change. Have you thought about changing? Just going with Nathaniel Murphy? I have, I have, but I think it's too late. I've had, I've, it's weird. Like I've had a couple of people say, oh, you're Zeppelin, right? I'm like, kind of, yeah. <laughs> Which, I feel fraudulent. You know, it's just a, a, a silly Instagram name that I cannot change. But you know, in one way, I'm kind of proud of it. You know? Yeah, yeah. So you've been uh, you've been playing a lot of guitars and demoing a lot of guitars at mm. CME for the past couple of years. What what's been a standout guitar for you since you've been there full time? That has you know, obviously there's there's the Dove, the B Bender, mm-hmm. sixty four, right? Sixty four Dove Dove with a B Bender. Yeah. What what else though has has really kind of like grabbed your attention and why did it grab your attention if i am see i'm gonna have favoritism here i'm gonna go for the noel gallagher j150 uh, it has to be that that's my you know favorite you know i've got it here so do you want to show you? yeah grab it One sec. so this is my gibson j150 uh noel gallagher signature guitar uh, capo already on the second fret, ready to go. You know, it's uh, no. So it was. It's funny how it happened. The shop managed to get a hold of one. They didn't tell me it was going to be mine. It was for a demo for the release. And I, so sometimes I get to bring the guitar home to you know prep for demo. You know, work and stuff and whatnot. And uh, I remember texting the boss and a few people at the shop saying. You know, can you reach out to whoever, whoever bought this? Are they local? Would they mind if I borrowed a guitar just to do some videos at home? Because, you know, it's an amazing guitar. And they were like, oh, I'm not so sure, blah, blah, blah. In the meantime, they're taking screenshots of that message and sending it to each other because they, you know, at the end of the video, they surprised me with the guitar saying, no, it's actually for you. Um, so that will always be my, my favorite demo. And uh, like I said, I got to meet him the other day. And look at that. Yeah. Yeah. Look at that. So, very That's cool. Great. I've, got, I've got to try and get that lacquered or something. I've got to try and protect that. But yeah, so that, that's up there. But in terms of like, you know, vintage guitars and whatnot, um, let me see. I mean, there's always a couple of strats coming in that are great. You know, we, we had one this week at the shop. I haven't done the demo on it yet, but it's a 63 strat. And I swear to God, it looked like it was a month old. Mm. It looked literally pretty much brand new so it's crazy what you'll come across and what people want to sell you know um yeah there's always cool stuff even pedals as well um we had so i, I was honored to play it i probably made a fool of myself on camera with it. uh we got a tube screamer that steve ray Vaughan used to use so one of his nice. actual, obviously i'm sure he used many over the years but uh so i got to play one of them but yeah there's always there's always cool stuff coming in yeah, a shop like that with its its notoriety and its size. I mean, I'm sure at this point it just attracts stuff, you yeah. know. It's just so well known for for selling that kind of stuff that people just send it there. So oh, of course. Yeah. So what was it like meeting one of your heroes last week? It it was 
I mean, it'll always be very special to me. And I, I wasn't like, let it be known, I wasn't like a fanboy. I wasn't like, you know, I didn't melt when I seen him. Um, he's, and he's the nicest guy you could meet, you know. Let that go on record as well. He's just the coolest down-to-earth person you could meet. Um, now, I mean, we don't know each other. Like, we don't have phone number or email or anything like that. But we we actually had a lot in common because we grew up, you know, obviously he's a bit older than me. We grew up probably about a mile, less than a mile from each other. Wow. Went to, went to the same schools, used to go to the same, I used to go to the same church that was part of his school, uh, from the same part of Ireland as well. Um, he knew all the pubs in between houses. Like I said, it's less than a mile apart. So um, a lot in common. You know, I, I don't claim to know him or anything, um, but let it be known, the nicest guy you can meet. He's very friendly, very nice. So a very special day for me because he made me want to pick up the guitar. Again, very lucky, very lucky. So, and I got to see him play the, uh, the next day with the High Flying Birds. Great concert. Well, luck is when preparation meets opportunity, right? <laughs> so they say, you know, um, I suppose in one way, I kind of worked hard to get to where I am at seeing me. You know, I, I did put in the hours practicing and lo and behold, thankfully, opportunity arose. Um, right. So yeah, a, pr- a proud moment for me. And, you know, again, I'd, I'm very fortunate that I've gotten to meet a few people that I've always looked up to. You know, uh, I remember Chad Smith was in there last summer. I was like, again, a bit starstruck, but again, re- just really nice people. I, th- I think that um, having you know spent time at in guitar retail and in meeting a lot of my heroes, we 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 always put these people up on a pedestal, and we tend to forget that they are still just people, and uh, most of the time they just want to be you know treated as such. And and it, all of the interactions I've ever had, uh, save for a very few um everyone just it, they just are down to earth and want to chat about the same stuff that you would expect them to and it, it's always it's always really comforting to to meet those people and not walk away from it disappointed or um anything like that as long as you don't make a fool of yourself and i've done that <laughs> to yeah. some of my heroes <laughs> no, i mean it's interesting you said it they are just the people too someone actually has said at the shop put it this way he said you know the normal people they shit too that's the way he, he put it. So a bit vulgar, but you know what I mean? They're just normal people. So I want to talk about your playing for a minute. So you've got such a cool style, you know, obviously there's a lot of Chet Atkins and in, in your playing, but in terms of your sound, is there a particular style of guitar style of amplifier that you gravitate to, or you think is sort of the Nathaniel Murphy sound or because every time I see you play, play on Instagram, you're, you're playing a different instrument. Is it kind of just whatever you pick up and it inspires a certain arrangement or style of playing? It, it can be. I mean, I'm always drawn towards tellies. I love tellies. Um, I didn't set out to get a telly. I, I only got it um, when I first moved to America. All I brought with me was my acoustic. And I went to a guitar center and uh, I was looking at... Uh, it, was, it was a cheap second-hand model. Uh, no, it was, there was a brand-new model. It wasn't a telly. I won't say what it was. Um, and one of the guys, I got to know one of the guys there, said, don't buy that. You're going to regret it. And so he pointed me in the direction of a second-hand, like a used telly, like a 2011 telly. I was like, oh, you know, I'm not really into tellies, but he said, no, look, you're going to like this. It's really good. And, you know, it's my go-to guitar. So I've, I've kind of fallen in love with tellies from that. Because, I mean, that's such a versatile guitar, you know. Um, I would, if if I could, I'd like to get a telly with a humbucker in the neck. I'm always uh, always a fan of that. Um, but, yeah, in terms of a sound, I don't know, really. I mean, I, I'm very simple when it comes to, to what I like. I like, you know, loud, clean amps. I do like reverb in an amp, uh, I must say. I, for some reason, if there's an amp without reverb, it's like, but that's just me. You know, some people prefer them without as well. That's, you know, everyone's different. But yeah, I, I love tellies. I love uh, ES, uh, I can't remember, is it 335 or 355? I always get confused. Um, very simple. You know, I like I like some pedals as well. I like delay pedals. I'm a huge fan of the Edge. So if I can try and emulate the Edge, that's always fun for me. I do like uh, a couple of fuzz pedals, overdrive. Uh, yeah, in terms of the style, I don't know. 
I don't know how to describe it. What? So if you could dive in a little bit deeper on the telly thing, what is it about the telly that kind of grabbed you at first? And then w- what keeps you coming back to that guitar? Well, on my particular model, I fell in love with the feel of the neck. Um, now, I don't know what type of neck it is. It just feels great to me. You know, I picked up some tellies before and it's like, oh, you know, it's good. It's not quite the neck that I, I prefer, you know. Um, I love the simplicity of it. You know, there's a lot, not a whole lot going on. Uh, it, there's some times where it's, where it's like I wish it could do other things. You know, maybe it'd be nice to have a humbucket in the bridge, but then it's like I lose that single coil telly set. It doesn't become a telly anymore. You know, I love that to do like the chicken picking and stuff uh, on the bridge. Um, but then I love the middle like the, the the middle pickup sounds combining the two, I think that's got its own unique taste and flavor to it as well. Um, and then, I mean, it's one of the coolest guitars kind of ever made. You know, some of the best players in the world played them. So if it was good enough for them, it's good enough for me. I do think if you were going to have one guitar to really do everything, like you, you've got one electric guitar. Mm. For a long time, you know, I think the 335 is up there as one of the most versatile guitars ever. But I think if you really, really boil it down, the Tele is probably the most versatile electric guitar out there, at least in my opinion. But I mean, I'd, I'd have to agree. I'd, I'd, it would be, yeah, it'd probably be between those two. Go, you know, it, they can jazz, they can, they can rock and roll, they can swing. You know, you can you can do jazz on it, bebop, whatever. You know, a bit of everything. And they're super reliable too, because like unlike a Gibson. They don't have most of them don't have the tuning stability issues. They're not as susceptible to, you know, swings and temperature. And, and, you know, it's basically, is it Brad Paisley that says it's like a cutting board with a neck on it. And, you know, there's not much to it. It's an incredibly simple design. It just works, man. Yeah. I don't like them that much. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, <here we> <laughs> of course. Well, now, you, now you gotta tell me why though. You gotta say, well, I know this is fine. I, I like, I just, um, I think at, for me, uh, I'm just a Les Paul guy and, 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 yeah. and, and a good PAF guy. And then I would choose a 335 for sure. Um, but just because like, it's just a comfort thing there. Like a Telecaster is not as comfortable for me. And, and I just like a little more heat coming out of the guitar, but I also, I'm one of those weirdos that I can play without reverb. I, I don't, I don't, I, I like like just making my own reverb. That's what I used yeah. to say when I, when I gig, <laughs> if I'm loud enough, I'll make my own. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm not, I, I think I always come across as contrarian Tourette <laughs> and it's not you my are. intention. No, I, I just, I don't know. Like to me, there's a reason why all the dudes that played tellies back in the day switched to Les Pauls. I mean, I agree. I do. I do like, a, if I'm going to like play something for myself, I'm probably going to play a Les Paul, but I'm just yeah, saying right. if you, if you really could only have one guitar and you had to play a bunch of different styles and a bunch of different stuff and it needed to be reliable and all, I think a telly is, is the move. That's all I'm saying. That's Paul. Yeah. But that's all I'm saying. But what, what did you, what did you grow up playing? What, what type of, what was your first my first thing? guitars were, were always strats. Uh, yeah. And that, I think that's because like I idolized um, Clapton and Stevie Ray Vaughan and all of that, but then it never felt right until I got I really got into playing Les Pauls and, and, and in particular carve tops because I had a special and that sort of thing. Mm. But moving into the the actual maple cap sort of real Les Paul, it kind of reset my brain into how I approach the instrument. And I mean, I think that's something that that we all go through. Uh, and that was something I wanted to ask you, Nathaniel, when because when you when you enter into these big guitar spaces you have a lot of ideas about what makes a good instrument, uh, what you like and what you don't like. But then, like you said, you play almost a different guitar in every video and you have all these interactions. It kind of turns that on its head a bit mm. and you start to see the forest for the trees a little bit. But has that happened to you? Like having gotten your hands on so many things, has it uh, taught you way more than you thought it would or, or flipped any thoughts on its head in, in regards to what type of guitars i like like style of guitars you mean or or, or yeah like what like what makes an instrument viable or uh what you what you liked or didn't like oh um, okay um i mean a few things i mean for me it's got to be comfortable to play it's got to be easy to play 
you know, I don't want to have to fight to play a guitar um, because if I have to fight, I'm not going to play it. You know, it's, it's just going to be a nightmare. Now, you could argue, well, just get a proper setup or whatever, and that's, that's fine. But, you know, there's, um, I mean, there's a lot of things at play, you know. The, the neck, like I remember there, I seen a Danny Gatton telly in the shop. They used one. I was like, oh, you know, a Danny Gatton telly, you know, a huge fan of Danny Gatton. The neck was the biggest neck I've ever come across in my life. It was like, you know, the, people often say, oh, it's a baseball bat. This, I mean, it was, it was bigger than that. It was crazy. I, I couldn't play it. And I'm not, I'm not, I don't get too hung up on, you know, big necks or skinny necks or whatever. Um, so, yeah, then it's got to be comfortable to play. It's got to feel nice to play, you know, sit, you know, can I stand up and play it nicely? Can I sit down and chill out with it? Can I be on the couch strumming away and be comfortable with it? Um, I mean, there, there's so many different variables, you know, is it going to be like a big jack, uh, jack, jazz box is going to be like a super 400 you know massive mm. where i've got to you know lean over the top to see what i'm actually doing <laughs> or is it like a has it got a vintage mose right or mose right neck you know where it's that the neck is that skinny you know the, it's just down to taste and preference i think but i think for me the main thing is it comfortable to play and does it sound good you know mm. I, i'm very much I don't like the argument of like you have to fight a guitar. I don't think I I, I don't I don't buy into that personally. Like mm-hmm. I think cre- the creation should be a fight like up here, but yeah. I don't think your hands should ever have to fight your instrument. Yeah. So, I'm with well, you on that one. Now, in one sense though, there's probably a lot of famous riffs and records that have come about from having to fight on a guitar. You know, it could have maybe been a slide riff that was like I'm, I can't fret any of the knots. I've just got to play slide in it. And lo and behold, you know, an amazing song has come from that. You know, yeah, I mean, Jack White talks about that all the time. He he sort of wants the whole experience of not just music creation, but, you know, the playing music live to be a fight. I remember watching It Might Get Loud for the first time, you know, 15 years ago, whenever it was, and hearing him talk about that with the white stripes, like, oh, I want to put the organ like a, a step farther away or have the guitar be, you know, and I guess for him that that works, you know, whatever it is in that struggle, it, it creates, you know, some really iconic stuff. So although I agree, I don't want, I don't want to fight my, my guitar either. Cause then that, that like pulls me out of the, any kind of creative mindset I have. It just, it's not, it's not for me. So you, you mentioned earlier, you're a fan of the edge. Mm-hmm. I am too. I love the edge. And I find that, people like us that are fans of the edge and guitar players have to like defend him a lot with a lot of other guitar players online. People seem to to, people talk shit about the edge all the time. Like he sucks. He's the worst guitar player. I couldn't disagree more. I want to hear what do you, why do you love the edge so much? And what would you say to someone who think, who thinks the edge sucks? I mean, this, this is a hot topic, maybe not at the moment, but over the years, like if you, you could put on a record and you'd know it was the edge. It's like, oh, there he is. That's, a, that's an edge-ism. You know, that's that's the edge doing that. It's like if we, as guitar players, we're, we're always trying to chase our own sound, try and be unique. There's not a lot of us that get to do that. You know, only the, the best of the best have managed to, to get there. You know, you, you could even, now in his case, it's like his use of delay and, you know, pedals and such and you could say the same for tom morello as well it's like mm. oh that's tom morello you know or you could go to the opposite end and it could be slash you know very little pedals but he's got that tone and his style of playing oh that's slash right there and then when people are, are shitting on the edge it's like look man you know he's got his own sound what have you got can you do that have you created your own sound have you you know sold a billion records you know from that no you know I don't know. Maybe that's just me, but I've never understood understood hate on anyone who's got got their own sound. It, it may be even the person that you're not necessarily into, but they've got their own recognizable sound. But you have to respect it. You know, mm-hmm. not shit on that. How how people could <clears throat> bash the edge is kind of beyond me because, like, just, it's always been in service of the song. Yeah. But even then. The riffs are great. The tones are great. Like I don't. Yeah. Like, I, what's there to not like about? Well, I don't. I don't get it. People say it's it's like 
too simple or if you take the effects away all he all he does is play effects and if you take the effects away he's playing like really basic elementary stuff and to me that's even more of a sign of his brilliance as a musician and a writer because yeah he he's arguably one of the best in my opinion guitar players that can play to the song and the the ability to use all those effects and use those sounds and tones to create the part to create the color or whatever it is that goes into the song, I think is brilliant. And to your point, Nathaniel, like what, what have you done? Like, where's yeah. your, you know, tr- multi-platinum sell selling albums on the wall? Like, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. That, I've, I've never understood that, that hate. It's uh it's a shame really, but I mean, people are entitled to their opinion, even if it is wrong. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I was going to ask, like, what are you listening to these days? Like, what's what's getting you excited about guitar? Who who sticks out to you? Is like you go and listen to someone, or you see someone on Instagram, or whatever it is, and makes you want to go pick up the guitar and play. Well, that's the thing. I mean, it's it's sometimes they make me want to pick it up, and sometimes they make me not want to pick it up. So <laughs> there's a fine line. But it's uh, I mean, that's the trouble with Instagram sometimes these days. It's like there's so many amazing players out there. So. Just off the top of my head, um, I've seen so Justin Derrico, guitarist for Pink, met, outrageous player. I was texting him this morning, it's like, look, man, you got to show me some of those licks from your videos. Uh, so he's going to be in town soon. So hopefully, I'll I'll get to meet him. I'd love to. Um, I'm really trying to get back into my uh, shredding. Um, so I've was, I was, I seen a Stephen Taranto, I think is how he pronounce his name. Just astonishing, you know, player. Um, I know it's not for everyone, but I, I like a bit of everything. So him, um, I'm really getting into uh, Michael Romeo. Um, I think he's, uh, you know, one of those underrated names that you know I didn't hear about until maybe a, you know a number of years ago. Um, played with Symphony X, and he's got his own stuff, but astonishing technique, and he's got it all legato, alternate picking, sweeping. But then it'll be other things. I could open it up, and it'll be it'll be Jake Workman doing a crazy bluegrass thing, and it's like. How's his right hand doing it? I need to know how to do that. Which kind of leads to a problem for me because it's like, right, well, I want to do shred. I want to do bluegrass. I'll I'll see Cecil. I think it's Cecil Alexander. I think that's it. Or Cecil. Forgive me if I'm not pronouncing his name right. I'll see him doing like double time bebop lines. It's like, well, I've got to do that now. And before I know, I'm, I'm completely overwhelmed with work or homework to do. Do you know what I mean? Have you ever heard... Uh... Jake Workman shred like on an electric guitar. I think I've seen him once. I, I think because he, he doesn't do. It. I think I've seen him once do a video on Instagram. I think maybe he had a, a, a telly or a PRS or something. I, no I, surprise, it was astonishing. You know? Yeah, he like. I never put the the the, like, the flat picking thing, and thought, oh, if you just add a lot of gain <laughs> and move it up yeah. from like the second fret, and man. It, it, it it is whenever you're trying to go down rabbit holes for styles, uh, it is so easy to get overwhelmed, especially if you like so much music. But I, I I'm I'm always I, I get really overwhelmed with Instagram by seeing just the sheer number of of talent that I I kind of have to take a step back from it because I, just like you, I can't. It, it just makes me not want to do anything. It, it can be overwhelming, right? Yeah. I, I think I said this to you previously in the past, right? Like the amount of screenshots I've got mm. on my phone, of, right? <laughs> must learn this. Must learn this. It could be a, 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 a Matteo Mancuso thing. It could be uh, Antoine Boyer thing, or just a, a gypsy jazz thing. I mean, I'm a huge gypsy jazz fan, but I haven't played it in ages because I've got so many other things that I'm, I have to learn. You know. Um, but yeah, it can be overwhelming. But it's fun though. It's inspiring. Yeah. You know? I remember where I was when I first saw and heard Jake Workman for the first time. We were in uh St. Augustine, Florida. I was on on the road with with my band and we had a night off. We were in the hotel and it was the CMAs were on that night. It was like 2018, I think. And you know how the CMAs are. There's a lot of just garbage bro country, you know, yeah. people playing at tracks or whatever. And so <laughs> we were kind of sitting there and you know, a, a few drinks in and, and just kind of talking shit about a lot of the pop country stuff. And then Ricky Skaggs and Kentucky Thunder came up and it they burned the place down. And Jake took this solo. It's it's on YouTube somewhere. You can see it. But Jake took this solo and 
I mean, we were all just screaming at the TV and like jumping up and down and hooting and hollering. So I immediately found him on Instagram and, and was following him ever since. He is just so unbelievably, he's like a machine, man. Like mm-hmm. his accuracy and his, his right hand and his time feel, it's crazy, crazy. And it, the, the funny thing is, so he, he was playing at the Old Town School of Folk Music here maybe maybe a year and a half ago, something like that. And so I got to meet him and, you know, uh, we're chatting. And I was like, look, man, you got to help me out with that right hand. Like, how are you doing it? And um, it's essentially the way he was doing it, just it's miniature strums is kind of the way he was, he, he kind of broke it down. Because when he's doing it, I mean, you look at his right hand, it's flawless. It's just, mm. it's just, like he said, miniature strums, just barely, it's just effortless. That's the way I can describe it. Obviously, he's going to make it look easy. He's, he's a, you know, astounding musician. And, if funnily enough, he's got a, he's got his own website where he, you know, breaks down. He's got like excerpts and tabs and stuff like that. So I need to kind of revisit that. More homework for me to do. But uh, <laughs> he's got like right hand right hand exercises that he likes to do, which he was telling me about. So I've got to check that out. Not that I'm ever going to get near his ability, but um, I, I bought a blue chip after that as well because uh-huh. <laughs> if I was going to be able to play it, I, now I mean it's here. That seems enormous to me. Yep, but look, the best players use them, so I might as well get used to. It. But I'm, I'm, uh, I always use a jazz three with a max grip. Has yep. to have a max grip, and they have to be the red ones. <laughs> I think the red ones sound different. At least normal jazz threes. I swear the black ones are different. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I, I just prefer the red ones. Has to have the max grip, and you know they're not for everyone. Sometimes at the shop, someone will say, "Oh, have you got pick?" And it's like, "Here you go." And it's like, "Fuck's that." <laughs> that I can't. I don't understand how you guys use the jazz three, man. I. I tried oh. it for a while when I was in music school and it just, it, I can't, I'm, I'm too, uh, I'm too shitty of a guitar player to like get around a small accurate <laughs> pick like that. You know, I have the touch of a blacksmith. So it, I just, I need a big heavy. I, in fact, the blue chip is actually probably my favorite pick. And like, I don't know if you know the story about those, the blue chip picks. I mean, they're, they're crazy expensive. They're like $35 a pick, mm-hmm. but um, I talked to the the owner of the company like a year and a half ago, and he was explaining to me how it started. Like it's a machine shop that specializes in making um, really, really high tolerance, complex parts that go into machines that make other machines. Basically, they work with like ceramics and all these crazy materials. And the material the blue chip is made of is this it's this DuPont material. It's incredibly hard to work with, but he was telling me about all the properties of it that they use it in like rocket engines and satellites and all kinds of stuff. Cause it won't burn. It, it basically like has a crazy high melting point, all this stuff, but they figured out that if they make it into guitar picks, it's it, they don't wear down. I have blue chips that are two or three years old that still have the same bevel on them. Yeah. And he was telling me that, they have to machine them that every single blue chip is machined on a CNC because the material is so hard that you can't make it. You can't mold it or whatever, like a normal pick. And because of that, they have right-handed and left-handed picks because they machine the bevels into them. Oh. Um, and yeah, he was telling me it's like something, I mean, the price will probably be wrong, but it was something like an eight by 11 sheet of the material is like six or $7,000. Yeah, it's crazy, crazy. So, what? yeah, the blue chip thing is is real. It's it's a vibe, and I, like you, it's like all the best players I know for the most part all play the blue chips. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll be honest. I haven't personally noticed a difference in the tone, but maybe that's just my ears. I mean, a lot of people say that. And again, the best players in the world use them, so they're going to know what they're talking about. You know, I'll, okay. I'll listen to them, but I personally haven't noticed it yet. I, I, it's more of a, the way it feels to me. I like the way it, like the way they don't wear down. And, you know, I just, to me, it feels, it's like the right amount of tension of the pick coming off the string just mm. feels right to me. But if you're the type of player that loses picks all the time, it's not for you because you're going to be <laughs> spending hundreds of dollars a month. <laughs> on guitar Which picks. one do you use? Like, so I've got, uh, it says, I think Jake recommended I get the TP60. So I've got that and I've got a 45, uh, is it 45 or something like that? Um, mine, mine are all downstairs right now, but I, I think I use the 50, the TP50. Okay. See if I have one up here. But yeah, 
It's like the normal, it's, you know, it's, it's the shape of like a, you know, Dunlop typical Tortex. Oh, it's just yeah. made out of the, the material. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. But man. I mean, it, it's always like a, a big transition anytime I go from a Jazz 3 to this. It's like I'm playing with a pebble or something. Well, <laughs> but they make a Jazz 3 size one. Yeah. Oh, they do. So, yeah. yeah they, so you got to get one. So can we talk about the Jazz 3 thing like real quick? Because yeah. I remember when I, so I, I like the Eric Johnson ones. Yeah. Uh, cause I think they're slightly thinner. Um, but when I discovered this, it was in a, probably a, you know, premier guitar article or something like that. Um, uh, talking about interviewing players, talking about why they use them. And, you know, everyone has said it, it just makes them more accurate and you have more control cause it's more about, uh, just your hand and in the movement strumming and picking. And I started trying them and I lost, I don't know how many, you know, when I, <laughs> Yeah. when I began using them. But after, uh, you know, a couple months of using it as my only pick, it really did like hone in my focus. And I paid a lot closer attention to my picking technique. Is that why you use these little red things? Well, yeah. I mean, how it happened originally, I just found one on the floor one day. <laughs> Honestly, I found one on the floor. I was like, fucking okay, no, hell, that's small. Like is, is is that just been worn away completely? Is that was that like an original size and someone just wore the life out of it? Obviously not. Um, but yeah, I, I got playing it. I was like, this is tiny, man. You know, I can't play with this. So you know, I go back to using other ones. But then for some reason, I kept getting drawn back to it. And it's like you said, uh, it's just more uh, for me. And I think a lot of other people, I can just be more accurate and more more articulate with it. You know, I'm, I'm closer to the strings. And also, like if these are the strings, it's not going. It's not going that that far down, you know. So with other ones, ends up down here. But now, if I'm doing like the whole string escape, you know, Troy Grady kind of stuff with alternate picking, it's just a lot easier for me, you know. Um, big fan of you know all that kind of stuff. I'll watch it now and again, you know, the technique. And funny enough, I was watching. I don't know if you guys know uh, Ben Eller. Yep. Uh, yeah, Uncle, Uncle ben. ben. Great guy. I've, I've never met him. I'd love to meet him. But uh, He's I a lovely speaking. guy. Yeah, he, he seems like it, yeah. He he did a video uh, probably about a year ago, and he was crediting someone else, so credit to that. I think it was a bass player at the time because I've always been fascinated by the right hand and, you know, I get infuriated with my right hand at times. But I used to play where, you know, my, my I was kind of loose. Like, these fingers were kind of flaring out. And uh, I do this a lot with my thumb. Mm-hmm. I've got a dodgy thumb. See, can you do that? Whoa. <laughs> you see, I've got a bit of a dodgy thumb there. Um, that's my excuse. But so, yeah, I'd, I'd be trying to do like alternate picking and my thumb would just be wiggling all over the place. So, and that can't have helped me much. But I remember seeing his video, Uncle uh, Uncle Ben, Uncle Ben Ella, and he, there was a video where if you, if you took another pick in the last two fingers, just close it enough where it doesn't fall and just relax. And work on that you know there's, there's less kind of motion or weight excess weight i suppose so if you were to clasp the pick in the last two fingers just hold it don't clench it just hold it enough where it doesn't fall out and that's a good position for your for your oh. right hand if you try that it i'm telling you it, it changed a lot for me you know? dude you're blowing my mind right now well it's, it's again it's not me i it's it's from ben ella and he got it from a bass player, I believe. So credit to those guys. But try it, and you'll be you'll be surprised, honestly. Yeah, because I play with my right hand when I'm playing, in, and I only really notice it because I, you know, editing videos of myself playing, I noticed that I kind of like tuck my fingers up like that out of the yeah. way, and it puts this tension in my hand that I guess limits the range of motion in my wrist. But that feels like even just doing that, it's like, yeah. oh yeah, okay. It even I, feels uh, more accurate right here. Yeah, <laughs> I started doing something similar when I I started using my fingers more. I tuck my pick, and so I would use my fingers and keep my my you know pinky and ring finger kind of fixed. But mm. yeah, that's interesting for people that are struggling with because because I, I always kind of have like a fist almost. But I see friends and they play with their fingers out and I'm like, hey, put those down. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's interesting because obviously there's a lot of players who. Are, have an astonishing right hand and they're like the complete opposite. Like they'll mm. be, it could be, uh, my, uh, Michelangelo Batio or Batio, I don't know how you say his name, or it could be Marty Friedman, you know, completely different. And they, you know, astounding players. Um, but for me, it certainly helped me. I was, I was a lot more relaxed and, you know, I just naturally go into that position now. 
So it helps me. It might help someone else. Yeah, I, can, I think some of that stuff, especially watching you know bluegrass players and then gypsy jazz players, it, you, you can learn, a, you can infer so much about how you can kind of focus your picking hand mm. um, based off how they move their, their hand in their whole arm. I mean, gypsy jazz is like an all in oh. like a shoulder thing. It's, and it's yeah. it's remarkable how those little changes can change your style dramatically. I mean, I do love gypsy jazz. I would I would love to be able to do it authentically. I know you need that percussive sound of you know yeah. with the with the rest stroke onto the next string and whatnot and the down strokes. I mean, I'm not going to change my technique at this point in my life uh, to be able to do it. Um, I would love to. Yeah, you know, I still play gypsy jazz. It doesn't mean you're not allowed to play it. Uh, but maybe some of the purists would say, well, it's not gypsy jazz unless you do that. And, I kind of get it, but for, unless you're for an actual it. gypsy, unless, yeah, <laughs> well, fuck it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play it anyway. So, <laughs> well, well, shall we uh, dip a rig here? Yes. Okay. So I have one. Here's one I prepared earlier. Um, so this is from Subro. Let me share this, and I think you guys. I know Red's gonna like this. Ooh. Ooh. Oh so, no 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 no. Yeah, can <laughs> confirm. So what Yo, we got you, here? You know, you know it's, I mean, you know, it's taken my uh, my view straight away. Is the is that the the this is Anfield? Is yeah. that a football you know, team? Do you know what that is? No, that's Liverpool. Liverpool. Oh, the Liverpool and Manchester. We don't get along, man. In terms of okay, wait. <laughs> Can I do? All right, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Zach, did you oh, pick this on purpose? Uh, look, I mean, uh, no, I did not. Look at this. Let's see. Can I crop it? Dang it. Bam. There you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so apart from that, we've got a uh, 1966 Epiphone Cornet, um, a 64 Wilshire with uh, both of these have the big speeds, which are cool. He's got a uh, Roger Mayer Octavia and then a Mark I Tonebender clone. Uh, the box that was on top is a Spring Reverb tank, and then that's a 64 top boost and um uh, that's it he doesn't say what kind of music he plays but i assume it's loud and fuzzy and sounds great so what do you guys think of this rick uh, I'll, let, I'll let you go first rick go on so i think these these two epiphones are actually you said 63 and 64 uh, 66 66 and a 64 there's a lot of 60s in this rig right here. Yeah, yeah. I, man, I think these are still kind of slept on. I think these are a good way to kind of get into the vintage guitar thing without dropping, you know, crazy money. Um, they're, they're creeping up there. They're starting to creep up there. I do, I do like both of these guitars. I love that dog ear P90. Uh, I don't. So the, here's the thing with Bigsby's, though. They look great, but they don't always function that well and then they are such a pain in the ass to restring unless you have the um was it the the vibra mate who makes the bigsby retrofit where you can string the the string through the the rear i, I think vibra mate makes a thing a little plate it's not that bad just kink it just take oh, this needle nose and kink yeah, it. yeah it, you say that and that's what i do on my gretch i have to kink it but then every single time you you pull the string down and then the ball end pops off one hack somebody told me that works is like if you get one of those uh those like pink erasers that you would get in school you know mm -hmm. they're like angled on the sides and then just use that to kind of shove it up against the the ball in there that'll work but you know um <laughs> i mean the two fuzzes but come on like yeah who uh who makes that mark one tone burner circle electric Circle electric is what it says, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, man. Look like it looks like it has a polytune on there too, uh, which may cause some weirdness. But but yeah, I think the guitars are great. My my big complaint with Bigsby's on these style guitars, and and you guys can let me know what you think, is sometimes because uh, on a slab body or a guitar where the neck is so low, the action on the bridge is really kind of low, and so you don't have a lot of tension on the Bigsby, so it doesn't do a whole lot mm -hmm. um except add a lot of weight <laughs> to the lower bout of your guitar but they they sure look cool you know <laughs> yeah i mean obviously i'm only messing with the liverpool badge i mean the, the amps are great <laughs> the guitars but that's the one the, the red one is a was it a 
cornet. It's a cornet, yeah. So I've I've seen them, and I've seen like uh, dog hair ones, I think, before. And oh, yeah, yeah, those are so cool. Yeah. I mean, they're cool guitars. On the subject of Bigsby's, I personally struggle a little bit. I love the thought of them. They look great, but this is purely just my view from a technique point of view. It kind of gets in the way of my, my right hand kind of has to adjust. Mm. That's just me. I mean, great looking guitars. So you'll have to explain. So we got the pedals because I'm not the biggest expert now. So they're two fuzz pedals, the, the gold one and that Thunderbirds car looking thing. Blue one. <laughs> right. So we got a, the, the, the gold one is a tone bender Mark one. So like the original, the original tone bender fuzz. Oh shit. And then the other one is a Roger Mayer Octavia. So like a Hendrix oh, Octavia oh, fuzz. Yeah. So just in a spaceship. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's 10 out of 10 right there. Just for them to, I, I know, man. All right. There's not, there's not really much you can rag on this except maybe a delay. You add a tape echo to this thing and. Well, yeah, going into the spring reverb and then into that 64 top boost. So I have a 64 AC 30, the silver bulldogs. And it's, it's a magical, a magical amp. Like to push that thing, it's loud as hell, but to, to really push it and to get into that, like either edge like bright sparkly kind of thing, or you can push it into that Brian may, you know, put a treble boost in front of it. It's a really, really special amp. Um, you have to be careful with those because 64, they still had the narrow panels on top. The vent panels were the small ones and they will overheat. So, oh, yeah. um, uh, I always heard that you want to put like some kind of small fan or something behind it. So whenever I run mine, I always have a little fan just kind of blowing in the chassis just to get the hot air out. Um, but dude, yeah, those two fuzzes, through that spring reverb into that amp is probably a a biblical sound. Oh, that's that's got to sound incredible, right? Now, again, forgive, forgive my ignorance. What's that? What's that bell looking thing? That silver. That's thing? that's a tremolo switch for what the the AC thirty. Yeah, or um, maybe it's a Vox. It's a Vox switch, but it mm-hmm. he might have it wired to like defeat the reverb or something too. I don't know. No, it's probably. I think it's probably for the the, the yeah, tremolo. It probably is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, apologies. I, I sound like such an amateur with this stuff, but I mean, no. to have like those pedals, that amp, the guitars. I mean, that's a pretty cool setup. I, I mean, I, I can't judge anyone's rig, man. So yeah, you can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you totally can. That's why you're yeah. here. Uh, so <laughs> one, one of my favorite things to do. I talk about this all the time with oct- uh, octafuzzes, uh, especially on a neck pickup, a guitar with a neck pickup. Go to the neck pickup turn the volume all the way down. It's different for different guitars and different fuzzes and stuff, but you, you find this sweet spot inevitably where you get this sort of huge ring modulation kind of funky sound where the fuzz and the, the octave isn't quite tracking just right. And then certain harmonics and that, that upper har, uh, upper octave will jump out and you, you can get the coolest sound out of an octave fuzz. Even if you're not into fuzzes, you know, I, I think that's a, a really, really inspiring sound. So <sighs> only thing I would change here for this rig is I want some kind of delay. Yeah. Uh, and with this rig being what it is, I mean, I would just say to hell with it. Get a get a tape echo, get a real one and just right. stick it on top of that reverb tank and go to town. Yeah. Uh, so otherwise, though. This this is rad. Nine point four shoils for me. Oh, uh, Daniel. Uh, well, you see, based on this image without Liverpool badge, you know, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give it a. I'll definitely give it. I'll give it a nine point two. No, 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 no. You know, I'll just give it a solid nine. Nine out of ten. Okay. I mean, I'd, okay. I'd personally. Personally, I'd play different guitars. I love the amp. I love the idea of the pedals. I'd like a delay. Um, I'd, I'd change the guitars for me. That's just me. No, I'll give, I'll give it. A, I'll give it a nine. Yeah, solid nine out of ten. I think. I, I mean, this is incredible. Uh, just, just take those Bigsby arms. Just put them back. Wouldn't, mm-hmm. wouldn't worry about it. Uh, man, I love it. Nine point eight. But wow. wait, hang on. Are, they, are these are these pedals rare? Are they hard to get them? Uh, the Roger Mayer, uh, less common. The other one is a is a copy. I don't know how common or what parts are inside. It depends it. on what parts are in it. Yeah, but uh, if, it, it, it none none of this is cheap. <laughs> no, <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> except the tuner. The tuner is like you can get that anywhere at Chicago Music Exchange. 
I've I've literally never seen that blue pedal looking. Is it blue or gray? My eyes are a bit dodgy. They're, they're usually like a grayish color, but mm-hmm. yeah, Roger Mayer, uh, he was he was Hendrix's um, like pedal guy and mm-hmm. like made the Octavia and all that stuff. So he uh, has a line. Uh, most of them uh, are in more normal looking pedal boxes, but for a long time he made the spaceship stuff and he'd have the fuzz face and the octave and all those sort of classic Hendrix sounds. Yeah. Very cool though. Nice. Well, Nathaniel, thank you so much for joining us, man. It's always, it's always a really good time getting to talk to you and hang out and yeah. Thanks. Well, thank you. Like I said, uh, I'm honored to be on it and you know, thanks so much for having me and hopefully we'll do it again soon. You got to come visit me by the way. You come up here and visit. I know. And you got to come to Atlanta because we've been I talking do. about doing something for a little while, so we need to yes. get connected on that. Not at this I'm time of year, though. It's a bit too hot for me down there. Come to Nashville first, and then Atlanta. It is, I can't, it is hot as hell down here right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we'll give it a couple weeks, a couple months, and then have you down. Definitely. Let's do it. Thanks, man. Awesome. Thanks. Well, what an interesting dude. Yeah. I mean, genuinely, uh, one of my, like I said at the beginning of the episode, one of my favorite players, but I've gotten to hang out with him a few times uh over the last couple years and you could not meet or hang out with a more humble down to earth nicer dude than nathaniel yeah it's um the first time i met him uh that that was all like everyone was coming up and talking to him and he just was so taken aback by that sort of feedback and and, and meeting someone who is so talented and yet so humble is is always it's always a real uh it's really refreshing yeah when, you, yeah when that happens yeah sometimes i want to i want to tell him like have you heard you like <laughs> do you know how good you are because yeah you'll have all these amazing players at nam or whatever you know come up to him and and you know he's just so humble and like you said taking it back and it's like yeah but dude like you know you're pretty good yeah, <laughs> so. yeah it's it's remarkable and and what a nice guy i'm just i'm just glad that that um we have talent like that in the community and 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 working at a high profile shop that can just really demonstrate stuff for for in the way it should be demonstrated so people can really understand how good these things sound yeah and he's around the shop uh from what i understand most days so if you are in or near the chicago land area drop by see me and go say hello to to old zeppelin barnatra and like we said follow him we'll have links to all of his uh socials and everything down below if you're not following him if you're one of the 12 people left over who are not following him you should be um yes so yeah awesome well do you have a, a shill i have a mr great shill. Rhett. i have okay. a great shill so why don't you go well, first oh, pff, all right yeah well i was trying to think like, what have i not shown that I, I i i love and i don't think i've shown this but i got this a while ago nice it's a super duper t- two in one this is from 2005 it's a like one of the hand painted ones yeah um there it is it has the back plate with the the pigtail on it but it, have you ever played one of these no no but i okay. had a um my first overdrive pedal i ever bought was a box of rock which i believe yes. is the super hard on on the left side yeah okay yeah it has it all of all of zvex's stuff is like some of them there's a lot of through lines you know like there's a lot of shared lineage but they all like sound so different and cool but the super duper two in one is a super super hard on um uh it's two of them in one box and so what you get is the individual volumes but then also a master volume so you can overdrive them the super duper or sorry the super hard on is i think at least 30 decibels of output yeah dude they're crazy (laughs) loud so you put two of those in one box and you get just an insane overdrive boost but you can set them low and and just really have um a nice tone shaping thing that adds a little bit of sparkle and life to your signal i love boost pedals and this is like an iconic one i got this at east side music supply um it was a pretty good deal for a hand painted one and i just I just love it because it's I and mean, look at that. It's like it's definitely one of the more um iconic looking guitar effects. Yeah, boost pedals, I think, you know, everyone talks about overdrives, everyone loves overdrives, and ODs are great, but if you've got a good amp or you've got an amp that will break up that you can push, I think you should probably 
lean more towards a boost in most cases, in my opinion, because absolutely you get it just it feels more natural to me. It's it's more of the character of the amp breaking up rather than a clipping circuit, uh, like instilling distortion into your signal going into the amplifier. Yeah. Uh, even if you have an overdrive, I think pulling the overdrive down and using it more as like a colorful boost is a cool way cool thing to do so absolutely and i i feel like there's enough boost circuits out there uh just like overdrives that you can have a handful at your disposal and really dial in like you can have one for every you know setup that you have that will accent an amp the best in the best way but it's kind of hard to beat um uh anything zvex makes so yeah Love nice. the super duper tune one. So what do you have? I, I think I know. All right. Now this, this, uh, I'm really excited, genuinely really excited about this. This might be like gear of the year for me. Um, now I did get this sent for free. So this is a shill. I didn't pay for this, uh, but they didn't ask for any video or any promotion or anything, but it is the, the new echo rec. Oh, from T Rex out of Denmark. This is, I'm so blown away that they were able to do this as well as they did. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar, the Benson Echo Rec is a drum echo. It's not a tape echo. It's not an analog delay or anything. Uh, the original one, which they've recreated here, which is part of why I'm so impressed. It took them eight years to do this right. So what you have is a spinning drum. And on that drum is a very very thin wire and that wire is wrapped around the drum a bunch of different times and then around it you have tape heads so it works similarly to a tape echo where you have one head writing the signal and then the other heads reading the signal back at different intervals that's what creates the echo effect uh, but it's not tape and so the echo rec most notably would, would have been used by you know david gilmore a lot this is the delay sound on the drums for when the levee breaks that mm. that echo sound is not the room at headley grange people always get confused about that they say oh it's the well no the echo came from the mics around the banister in the rooms like no it didn't the room sound the reverb came from that but that actual echo that like slap back delay was an echo wreck set up in the truck in the recording truck at headley grange um jimmy this is fact jimmy page talked about this <laughs> People still like to argue about it, though. Anyways, um, really cool. The original ones were tube driven. Uh, and a friend of mutual friend of ours, Kevin Kadish, has an original one. And I want to bring mine up to shoot out against his original one. This is solid state, uh, which basically means it's more reliable. Um, yeah. Original ones are ridiculously expensive and they're hard to maintain. There's a f only a few people out there that can maintain them properly. Um, but yeah, it's super cool, man. It, it I'm so excited that T-Rex was able to pull this off. And it's got some nice modern features. Like it's got XLR inputs, balanced inputs on the back. So you can send vocals through it and everything. And we've been using it all this week to record Tice's. I put his vocals through this. I put his guitar through this. It's, oh, I'm so stoked. So, And didn't they say that the drum will never wear out? Yeah, now you do. There is Unless some, you damage some, it. Yeah, there's some maintenance. Like you do have to oil the, the it comes with a little um bottle of lubricant for the wire, but it's not very often. But you do need to uh to oil it. And I just noticed that this is serial number twelve. So Man. early early I don't know why my camera's not focusing, but anyways, it's not cheap. This is not for everybody. I would not recommend this for everybody. They're twenty one hundred dollars. And the fact is there's a lot of pedals that do the echo rec thing really, really well. Like the Boonar, um, oh, what's that Boonar pedal called? There's uh, a Boonar echo rec, the, the Strymon, uh, wh why am I blanking on the name of the Strymon? I can see it right there. Oh, oh, no, uh, the, the Volante. The, yeah. The Volante that is supposed to be an echo rec basically. Yeah. Um, well, I heard you play that one. Well, not that one specifically, but that pedal uh unit it's not even a pedal really at um at nam and it it every everyone asked that was one of the questions i got asked the most after this last nam like how good was that echo rec like it's really good it's, it's really, really good really man good. it's really good i plugged it up and was doing the run like hell riff oh yeah it's 
it's the sound it it is the thing yeah. um so again it's a bougie piece of gear it's not for everyone i wouldn't recommend this for everyone but if you are like me and you're a nerd for this type of shit like old school analog echoes and stuff it's really cool man and it's really good next so, step is that uh those whim cabs dude and uh <laughs> man at atlanta discount my shop near me uh there is there was two rick bought one but there's a 72 high watt cab with the original fanes the purple back oh. fanes uh and they're in great condition i'm thinking about going down and getting the other one but just what yeah. you need yeah another 412 <laughs> well um let's let's thank our our patrons over on patreon one more time if you guys want to learn more about supporting the show and all the perks and uh membership benefits you get over on patreon hit the link in the description below and uh check out the tiers support the show and uh join the community while we're um you know, recording these episodes and uh, another big thank you to the sponsor of today's episode Stumac. You can get 10% off your order at stumac.com via the link in the description box down below. Still waiting on someone to buy that go bar deck. I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but <laughs> go get well, a pedal kit, get a pedal kit. Yeah. And uh, paint it. Yeah. And then sh- send it to us. I'd love to see it. Someone get a pedal kit, paint it with a dipped in tone theme and tag yes. us in it it doesn't have to say dipped in tone but like something from the show you know whatever tag us in it and we'll uh i don't know we'll do something we'll figure out something to oh, do oh man that would be great have a like a shoyles industries one oh, sh- dude or, yeah yeah wait wait okay hold on hold on <laughs> we got to talk about this yeah, we got a workshop all this right everybody <laughs> <laughs> see y'all bye